Focus. How do you get more of it? Focus issues are the most common theme in the questions I get on YouTube with Tech for Psych. And this is for good reason. Without it, you are a ship without a rudder and a leaf within the wind. Wouldn't it be awesome to have laser-like focus that made you feel energized, excited, and in tune with your work, and just far, far away from any distractions possible? Over the years, humans have come up with different ways to try and improve focus through pharmaceuticals, nootropics, and exercises like meditation. But what if there was a new way, a different and convenient way without side effects? Well, for the first time ever, we have a wearable that is capable of tracking the blood flow to the frontal lobe of your brain to help you improve your focus. So my name is Dr. Cody Rawl, and I'm talking to you about the new Mendy wearable f device. This video has been a long time coming. I've spoken to experts, tested things out for myself, and built up a knowledge set that I'll share with you in this video. We'll take a look at technical specifications, address any safety concerns, test things out, and compare the Mendy to other devices in the market solely for your education in this rapidly evolving neurotech wearable field. So blood flow to the frontal lobe could be used to track a lot of different things, but Mendy is really zeroing in on focus and executive function control. The ability to be self-aware and make decisions is probably one of the most valuable skills we have as humans, so it seems like a good place to start for neurofeedback training. And although the company cannot specifically say that it for example, treats ADHD because of FDA regulations, it's not difficult to see that training the frontal lobe to increase its blood flow for attention could help people with diagnosable conditions, as well as the everyday user that is struggling with attention issues, especially in today's world where your attention is constantly being grabbed by different stimuli in the environment. I spoke to Mustafa Hamada, who is a neuroscientist and the head of science at Mendy, and he really explained this issue very well. See, ADHD is not just structural and functional altercation of, of congenital, obviously, of the prefrontal cortex, but there's also studies that shown actually perfusion issues to the prefrontal cortex. So the blood flow to the prefrontal cortex is also affected. Attention, like I said, is, is stimulus oriented. You know, if I snap my fingers, people look at it, right? That's attention. But focus is goal oriented. It's, it's prolonged attention. So because learning something, a language, a skill, or playing music is, takes concentration. You know, everything in your life that you're proud of, that you learned, takes deep focus. If you can't concentrate, you can't live, you cannot learn anything worth learning. So here's the Mendy, and one of the reasons why this device is so fascinating to me is really here in my hand is the first time we have a mass-produced device that uses a very interesting brain imaging modality called FNIRS, Functional Near Infrared Spectroscopy. It uses red light to bounce off of blood flow and track how the frontal lobe of your brain is functioning. This is a completely different modality than most of the devices that I've reviewed on this channel, which often use electroencephalography or electrical signals from the brain to track how the brain is working. Actually using this device is relatively simple. The app has a ball that increases and you get these stars that go off as you increase the blood flow to your frontal lobe. So it's highly likely that increased blood flow to the frontal lobe of your brain is going to help you with focus and decision-making skills. One of the things that I really love about this device is that you don't have to worry about wetting any sensors, getting them behind your ears or through your hair like the EEG sensors. It's just very easy to throw on and have touching your scalp for tracking the blood flow. Because the red light with the sensors just needs to be close to your scalp, you can just throw it on as easy as this and it's ready to go. Now don't let the simplicity of this device fool you. There's a ton of cutting edge technology in here. There's a light in the center that emits both red and infrared light at 660 nanometers and 800 nanometers in wavelength. There's the central LED light emitter with sensors at three centimeters on each side that catch the light as it bounces off the blood flow of your brain and back. There's another sensor on the right side that is one centimeter away from the LED that picks up the light coming back from blood flow in the scalp. So the device is doing all these calculations, subtracting out muscle artifacts, light from the surrounding environment, and even blood flow from the scalp, which is separate from your brain. And I sat down with the chief technology officer, Ricard Ekloff, and he did a great job of explaining this. Yeah, it's actually really cool. It's basically shining a flashlight uh, on your brain because uh, it's uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation, so light. And uh, you're choosing specific wavelengths, so you engineer it in such a way that you can infer 
uh, characteristics of the blood flow uh, in that local area that you're measuring. Engineers and researchers have found out if that if you shine uh, lights of different wavelengths on oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin, they interact with that particular wavelength of light differently. And based on that, you can, you can calculate the amounts or the relative levels of oxygenated hemoglobin versus deoxygenated hemoglobin. And that's why you can infer uh, that this local area, for example, uh, holds more oxygenated blood flow uh, than another area. Basically, the light coming out here takes a banana-shaped path through your prefrontal cortex and reaches this point eventually. And uh, we capture it there. And that's why we read the oxygenation and, and deoxygenation between these points. It penetrates 15 millimeters into your uh, skull. And on the other side, you have a symmetric uh, sensor, the same, 30 millimeters here. So it's basically measuring your left and right half of, of this Broadman Area 10 uh, around here. Um, and then we have a, a third sensor right here. That is the one that, that's a little bit closer to the meter. This one, again, reaches only half the depth, or sorry, reaches only half the width of this distance. So it's only reaching about six millimeters down. And that doesn't reach the brain itself. It only reaches uh, the skin and a little bit of the scalp. And the reason why we do that is uh, for calibration purposes, because you have a lot of blood flow in your skin as well, of course. And we can use that information and, and in real time subtract it from the, 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 the actual sensors that are measuring your neural activity. So it's basically the, the way that, that you get rid of what's called systemic artifacts like uh, blood pressure or, or Mayer waves or whatever have you. It's a lot of technical words there, but it's a calibration method. Now, it is important to try and use it somewhere where there's not too much light because that may interfere with the signal. As you can imagine, the sensors are trying to sense how much light is bouncing back from the LED off of your scalp and your brain and back to the sensors. So any extra light in the surrounding environment may alter or affect the recordings which is a little ironic because I actually shot the opening scenes to this video in very bright conditions in Death Valley, California. As you know, I'm trying to grab your attention and it's for theatrical purposes, but you can see the experiments that I ran, I actually had to do it in a darker room for the least amount of interference. Now the company is working really hard with their software algorithms to make sure that light is no longer an issue in the near future. And the light interference has already improved dramatically since I started using the device three months ago. The battery lasts for a good six hours and it runs on both iOS and Android devices. It weighs about 75 grams, it's soft to the touch, and the band almost reminds me of a nice pair of ski goggles. I really enjoyed wearing it for long periods of time. Now you might have heard me say, oh, there's a laser in this device and it's a bouncing light off of your brain and your scalp and you might have some safety concerns there, which is fine. I can assure you that this light is completely safe. It's wavelengths that you get from sunlight and in fact, it's safer than sunlight because it doesn't have the ultraviolet radiation that sunlight has. You might also be thinking about other devices that I've reviewed on this channel and wonder if this one is the right one for you. Well, I can say what's really interesting about FNIRs, especially in this case, is it's very focused on the frontal lobe of the brain. Take a listen to how Ricard explains this and uh, see for yourself. EEG uh, is great and all, but it has the like the deficits of EEG is that it's it's very it's a very average type of technology, and what I mean by that is that it captures many 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 neurons all across the brain and gives you one output uh, in, in in the frequency domain saying, yeah, basically your brain in this area averaging at around this frequency whether that's uh, alpha, beta, or theta, or whatever, well, that's super interesting. Uh, it doesn't say that much about that particular local area of your brain. So when you, when you talk to uh, neuroscience researchers uh, and, and, and laboratory people, they are actually more interested in using the FNIRS approach or, or a combination of both. Because FNIRS uh, is a local measurement where you measure a, a, a local area. So I, I, if I had a sensor in this area, I wouldn't catch the readings over here. They would only be in this area. And why is that important? Uh, it's important because you can draw more conclusions based on that. You can do uh, the things that is called functional um, imaging of the brain, 
meaning I can see dependent orders of different areas of your brain lighting up in a specific order. And that's how you map the, how the brain works, really. And that's how researchers do that nowadays, is that they don't just look at the connection, the, the white matter between uh, different parts of the brain. They actually look at using imaging technologies to figure out which parts are connected to what other parts and in what order are they triggered to figure out the root and cause of, of effect. So that's one of the biggest thing. The locality is, is, is much, much, much better. So I really went wild and tested this device in a bunch of different situations, both for actually validating that it works and for my own curiosity about how it actually tracks blood flow and what different things affect it. First, I sat down and did a regular session and you can see that graph here. So this is an 8% increase in frontal lobe blood flow. This is pretty average for me when I'm not trying to increase the signal with different meditation techniques. And I'm just sitting quietly with a clear mind. The other metrics of control and resilience reflect how long you were able to sustain an elevation in the frontal lobe blood flow activity and keep it increasing throughout the session. As far as points go, you earn your first star in a run when you have sustained elevation and activity for three seconds, followed by an additional star point for each second of sustained activity of that run. Control is the longest streak of stars that you were able to sustain in the session, and resilience is from the number of star points that you got during the session. Next, I really wanted to validate that it tracks blood flow. So what I did is actually put it on one of the biggest muscles on my body, which is the quadricep muscle. This first graph is just the many sitting on my leg without any flexing of my leg muscles. Now remember that there is blood flow in your leg, so some activity on a quiet leg is to be expected, and there was a 7% increase in activity here. Next, when I flexed my leg muscles to get the blood pumping, it tracked a 25% increase in activity. I should also note that there was a lot of error warnings during that training because the Mendy could sense that there was too much movement going on in the training and warned me about that. So flexing my quad actually increased the signal on the app, which is to be expected. But what I found very fascinating that I didn't expect is that uh, when I was flexing, if I held on to the flex, the signal actually went down. And when I relaxed, the signal would go up after a flex. And what I realized what was happening is that when you constrict your muscles, it actually restricts the blood flow because those muscle cells are contracting and consuming a lot of oxygen and applying a lot of pressure so blood can't get through the arteries. But when you relax, your body knows that that muscle tissue needs oxygen, so it sends a bunch of blood and fresh oxygen into it, which is why the signal went way up when I relaxed my leg after flexing it. Another thing that you can try at home is to hyperventilate a little bit to increase the oxygenation of your blood and increase your scores that way. I tried the Wim Hof method, and you can clearly see in the graph how the levels went up, peaked, and then went back down when I started holding my breath after the hyperventilation period within the Wim Hof app as he instructs. I wouldn't recommend doing this all the time because it really reflects an increase in blood oxygenation levels in your brain and does not necessarily mean that you are actually activating your frontal lobe. Next, I wore the device while playing the guitar with a nice 21% increase in frontal lobe activity. You can see that there was more sustained activity here compared to when I was doing the leg flexing. With the guitar, the resilience factor was at 636 versus when I was flexing and relaxing my leg, it was at 219. This is because with the guitar, I was getting a more sustained increase in blood blood flow to my frontal lobe than with the blood that was pumping in and out of my leg as I flexed it. There's probably some discussions here to be had about cognitive learning versus flow state while I'm playing the guitar and how that affects brain activation patterns, but we're gonna have to see that for another video. Then I did some testing with direct electrical stimulation using a patch from Philzing that I will be reviewing on this channel soon. There was a nice increase in activity there with 19%. I also did lay down for five minutes and do a little nap test with my eyes closed. That got a 9% increase in activity and that could have been due to my mind wandering a bit as I was thinking about different things as I lay there I'm not really sure we'll have to do some more testing and finally I did do a short test with the neo rhythm on the energy and vitality settings and only got a 6% increase in activity again I'm not really sure what's going on there I need to do more testing I would love to test all the different neo rhythm settings with the Mendy to see if those patterns really pan out and if the different settings have different frontal lobe activation patterns I just want to remind you that it was really fun to do these tests to validate the signal, but remember that the overall idea when you are using Mendy is do a few minutes of unaided neurofeedback training daily with the system so that you can learn how to increase the blood flow to your frontal
frontal lobe through operant conditioning and have your own ability to improve your focus by getting that blood flow pumping to your frontal lobe. So a couple of issues that I noticed with the device, as with any brain wave or blood flow sensing device, you have to sit really still for the most part for it to get a good reading. If you wrinkle your forehead or move around, it's going to notice that and give you a warning as you're going through the app. The other thing is you don't want to be doing it in a brightly lit room right now. You want to reduce light interference as much as possible. So if I wanted to get really good readings, I would go in a pitch black room. I don't think that that's absolutely necessary, but for testing purposes, I wanted to do that. And as I said, they're really improving the algorithms quickly, so light shouldn't be much of an issue anymore. Mendy has done an incredible job of delivering a quality product that is using continuous FNIRs, which has a ton of utility right now as well. And uh, I really commend them on creating an awesome consumer level device for us to use. Right now, the device and the app are really optimized for an extremely easy use. You just throw it on, get into the app and start training. In the future, I would like to see them offer more advanced options for people that watch this channel or Facebook groups that I'm involved in that really has more biohacker, neurohacker nerds that really want access to different things like access to the raw FNIRS data, be able to do heat mapping to see brain activation level patterns, time series in which you can see uh, the activation patterns over time, a little bit different than the graph that they have now, kind of like the mind monitor that you can use with the Muse headband, and also tracking differences between right and left frontal lobe activation patterns, which we know from neuroscience studies can have implications in depression, bipolar disorder, and other activation patterns of the brain. In the near future, they will likely be adding features for heart rate variability, which I know a lot of people love. It's really great to track heart rate variability with brain activation, and I think that's a feature people would really enjoy. At $359, this device is really comparable in price to the majority of devices I've reviewed on this channel, so it's very competitive there. The makers of Mendy were nice enough to offer a 10% discount fee and free shipping through the Mendy link in the description of this video below for Tech for Psych watchers. You won't find this deal anywhere else, and I'm really appreciative that they did that, and I'm glad that I get to share it with you and the rest of my listeners. So in conclusion, if you want a device that's super easy to use, uses a really cool modality for tracking your brain function and you want to increase your focus and your decision making capabilities, Mendy is really the device to go with right now. I will be posting my full interview with co-founder and chief technology officer Ricard Ekloff because he had so many great things to say about creating the device from scratch, the engineering, how the hardware and the software works. It, I couldn't include it all in this video, but I really want everybody to be able to see that interview. So I'm going to post it in and it's entirety next week. I want to do more videos with Mendy in the future with direct comparisons to other devices, guides on best use practices, different meditative techniques and cognitive techniques to influence the signal and testing in different environments. So I'm really looking forward to doing that. Be sure to leave questions below about the device. I'd be happy to answer them. Make sure you subscribe and uh, tune in for the episode where I interview Ricard next week. I'm Dr. Cody Roll with Tech for Psych. Thanks so much. Talk to you next time.